The 2023 WNBA season has officially come to an end, but that doesn't mean there isn't WNBA news to discuss. And I have the one and only, my three Anamaraman of Defector, here to dis- discuss some of that news, which includes some new WNBA head coaches. The Locked On Women's Basketball Podcast, it starts right now. Ogumba Wallet for the win! You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Hello and welcome. You are locked on to women's basketball. I'm Jackie Powell. I'm one of your Friday hosts. I cover the New York Liberty here at the next. I also help with social media strategy at the next and I've covered the sport of women's basketball more broadly and nationally at places like Bleacher Report, Sports Illustrated, Hartford Current and many more. We want to thank you for making Locked on Women's Basketball your first listen every day. And remember that Locked on Women's Basketball is brought to you by everyone at The Next, a place where we cover women's basketball all the time, and we tell the stories that need to be told every day. Subscribe now to support the staff at The Next that works oh so hard. It's $9 a month or $72 per year. Also, we've been breaking records right here at Locked on Women's Basketball. We continue to grow each month in our listens, and that's all thanks to you, dear listener. Remember that Locked on Women's Basketball is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and many more. Today's episode is brought to you by Dave. Download Dave today at dave.com slash locked on NBA. You could get up to $500 in five minutes or less. No credit check, no late fees. All right. So last time you and I were together, dear listener, I had Matthew Walter on. We discussed the WNBA finals and he and I tried to predict WNBA finals game three. We were both wrong again, surprise, surprise, but his series prediction was correct. Congratulations to the back-to-back champions, the Las Vegas Aces. But anyway, my three and I are here with you all to not discuss, or to not only discuss her brilliant piece, quote, the Mercury turned to a girl dad to solve their problems, end quote, which I will be attaching in our show notes Please read it if you have not already. We're going to discuss that piece and the Mercury's hire, along with making sense of the other hire and other coaching introduction that we saw this week in Chicago. And we're going to talk about how they compare, how they contrast, and what they all mean. So, and then in our third segment, we're going to be doing something very exciting, which I've never done before. We are going to do an around the horn style buy or sell. I've got a couple of like questions, conditionals that I'm going to pose to my three. She's going to tell me, does she buy this? Does she sell this? And why? So I'm very excited for this. My three, thank you so much for coming on. My first question for you is take me through why you felt so inclined to write that story that you did about the Mercury and Nate Tibbetts. Yeah, I think, um, so coaching hiring practices in any sport, especially the WNBA, since I cover it, um, are very interesting to me because I think in the rest of the sport, every other personnel evaluation you're going to make is a lot easier. Like on the court, there's just this meritocracy and straightforwardness to it. If a player is good, they're going to get minutes. You'll probably be able to see it on screen. It'll probably show up both in their production and in the advanced stats. It's all very neat. And then you take one step out of bounds on the sideline. 
all of that goes out the window, right? It's very hard for me, even as someone who's watched basketball of all kinds in different leagues for you know 20 years now to know who's going to be a good coach, to know who's going to be a good hire, to be able to, to look at a team's success and say, X percentage of this is because of the coaching. Um, it's, it's such a weird job, right? Like you have to be a manager and a tactician and a motivator. And I don't know that those areas have much natural overlap. I don't know that every team needs an equal amount of all of those different things from their coach. It's so situation dependent, I guess, in that respect, it's like playing. And then good coaches come from all different kinds of backgrounds, really great, like on paper seeming candidates don't work out. Sometimes the the person out of left field does work out. It's just really weird. I always say like coaching is voodoo. I have no idea. Um, and, and so I think when I wrote this, I was not really interested so much in the question of whether Nate Tibbetts is going to be a good coach, whether he's going to be successful, just because I don't know, I can't predict the future um, and, and no one knows the answer to that. And so what, what interested me about his hiring and, and I think why I wanted to write about it, the only thing that we can really evaluate at this stage is uh, the process, and yeah, part of that is is the optics, and I think what it how it bodes for coaching hires in this league going forward. And I think the big the big question I had that's still sort of unanswered is: Are we going to end up in this ironic situation where, as a result of the increased investment in WNBA teams that we're seeing, I think across the league from a lot of different ownership groups? Are we going to end up in this situation where these jobs become more attractive to NBA people? And then all of a sudden, you know, women who have worked in the league, women who have worked in women's basketball are being crowded out. I'm, I'm not going to say it's necessarily a trend. It's just like this has just happened the one time. And I think I'm still, um, you know, we, Nate Tibbetts said in his press conference, I'm one of three male head coaches. If we had had this conversation what, three, four seasons ago, that number is way higher. And so generally I'm, I'm pleased with the progress that WNBA teams have made in, in hiring women and hiring for, former players and hiring black women. Um, but I'm, I'm just curious. And so, you know, it wasn't a condemnation of, of him. I think he was kind of put in an awkward position by the way his hiring uh, was messaged by the, the girl dad, uh, uh, style of, of advertisement, but, um, you know, it was, it was something I wrote more with, with questions and wanting to think through it rather than a, a really hard, cold take. For sure. And I think when you talked about the potential trend of, okay, here we're at a point where the majority of the coaches are women, do we start circling back? to how things were when the league first began. Because as you wrote so brilliantly in your piece, looking at history, and history is very important when we talk about the future and the present too, there were a bunch of former NBA folks that made great careers in the league. Bill Lambeer, Mike Tebow, who is now still the general manager of the Washington Mystics. And so you just hope, does the history, do we move forward or are we gonna keep moving in this, this interesting cycle? Because also part of that I find is that when the WNBA first came onto the scene, it was very much so treated like this novelty. It was like, ooh, what is this new thing? We have to become a part of it. And now in the year of 2023 and I trace this via the fact that you see Joan Jett back at a WNBA game. You see Jason Sudeikis, you see Alicia Keys. That renaissance is coming back. And so it begs the question, when it comes to these cycles spinning around again, do, does that happen in coaching? We really hope it doesn't, but we have to beg that question. Yeah, and, and I actually compared it to the passage of Title IX, which was obviously this huge boon for, for women athletes, for women's sports um, at the collegiate level. So many athletes will tell you they are, you know, Title IX success stories. But before Title IX, I mean, something like 90% of 
coaches of women's teams were women. Um, and then afterward, again, because ironically, now women's programs had this legitimacy, had these resources, well, suddenly these jobs become attractive to men. And suddenly, you know, now that women's teams were under the same umbrella of athletic department um, as, as men's teams, you have male athletic directors in charge of hiring and um, the, the women coaching ranks were basically devastated by it. And so, you know, again, I can't say it's a trend or it's going to happen. This has just happened one time, but I am curious. It's, it's something I didn't really think about when I was praising teams for their investments. I think because the first time this happened, the first million dollar head coach was a former WNBA player, was this, you know, legendary name. And so I was maybe kind of swept away in that. I didn't really think about it down the line. And so um, this, this was just interesting to me and I think forced me to, to think about some of the consequences of, of that investment um, in ways I hadn't really thought about before. Absolutely. And you also have me thinking, well, wait, could, could there be a situation where top coaches from women's college basketball say, hmm, you know, I don't have to recruit all year long, or, oh, the season's a little bit shorter, but I'm getting X amount of money from these ownership groups that are investing a lot. Um, someone I think about is, I think about, well, Nikki Collin, current head coach of Baylor women's basketball, who is trying to change an ocean that is Baylor women's basketball. And, you know, that that's hard when they're used to many years of, of Kim Mulkey and, and championships, and she's implementing this modern style is there a situation where Nikki Collin is lured back to the WNBA? I just wonder, did the Phoenix Mercury give Nikki Collin a call? That is something I would love to know, which brings me to my next question for you. Did we really gain any sort of clarity into why this specific coach from the NBA? Yeah, there were kinds of these allusions to the process that it was this really wide ranging search that they had looked at, at men's basketball and women's basketball at college international, um, that diversity and opportunity were priorities in the search. Um, and still they had, they had led down this road. Um, so, you know, there, there weren't a lot of specific names. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know that there were, were, I didn't really get a sense of how seriously other candidates were taken. I think when you make a, a hire like this, you're, you're paying someone a million dollars because you wanted to go out and get that specific person. Um, and so, you know, I, I do wonder how, when they say they they, that diversity was a priority, how, how serious was that priority? Was it Priority number one, was it a little bit down the line? I don't think we've got great answers. And it just, it, it makes me think about, in order for us to know who some candidates were, that requires reporting on the process. And there really wasn't a lot of reporting on the process at all. I mean, when we talk about the Chicago mm -hmm. sky later, We'll talk about how there was a little bit of it, but there only really was one name attached to that process throughout the entire process, to be quite honest. But it just, it, it's really curious to me how, as you said, they talked about this, this very, you know, global process. I mean, I think it was Richard Cohen at Her Hoop Stats who was sort of like, well, maybe Marina Malkovich, the former head coach of Fenerbahce and who is, I believe the Serbian team national coach, maybe she should get a call, but we're not going to know. We won't know until someone is able to tell that story and report it. So I think my next question for you here before we take a little break is what exactly did we learn about what Nate Tibbetts and Nick um, 
you ran his, what is their vision for the Phoenix movie? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, Nate Tippett's did have a sort of tactical vision for it. He wanted, you know, a faster pace and an offense. Um, I don't know that he really spoke about it in specifics in terms of, okay, how does your personnel really mesh with that? And so, and, you know, he did say, I'm going to need time and help from the team to, to learn the league, which, you know, that quote, I think didn't go over very well. Um, again, I think to maybe sort of in his defense, I don't think he was put in a really great light by the way the team handled the hiring and the announcement. And so he had to kind of be on defense the whole time, um, which, which is awkward though. I don't think that was really a great answer to, to the question. Um, and so, no, I, I mean, I, I didn't really get a sense of a vision, the, the kind of bigger picture things have been really from ownership that that they are going to take the team seriously, that that they do want to spend money, that they're going to build a practice facility, but the kind of granular, what is this team going to look like? What is our offense going to look like? We did hear that Diana Taurasi is going to play defense. So maybe that's, that's a specific, that's definitely a new vision for this team, isn't it? Um, but, but other than that, I'm not sure. And again, there's only so much you're going to really get from, from a, a press conference in terms of you have to actually see it on the court too, right? Anyone can, can say what they want. That is true. I should one day go through all of the very recent coaching intro pressers and count to see how many times the word pace is used. Yes. <laughs> Something I will do at some other point but before we get to talking about the Chicago Sky and what is going on in Sky Town with their hire, I do want to talk to y'all all about our title sponsor, Dave. So finances can be so intimidating, especially now with student loans being back after a three-year reprieve. That's why you need Dave. Dave can make managing your money so much easier with an interest-free extra cash advance, uh, fee-free goal tracking, and easy ways to find a side hustle to make more money. Dave is the banking app that is leveling the financial playing field. When you download Dave, you could get up to $500 in five minutes or less, no credit check, no late fees. It's a part of Dave's extra cash account. Advance the money you need with no interest, then settle up later. You can even build credit when you settle up on time. Millions of people have already downloaded Dave to help make their finances easier. Download Dave today at dave.com slash locked on NBA. That's dave.com slash locked on NBA. You could get up to $500 in five minutes or less. No credit check, no late fees. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Eligibility criteria and instant transfer fees apply. Banking services provided by Evolve. Member FDIC. And also... I would like to tell you all about another sponsor of ours. That is Jace Medical and exactly what the Jace case is. So let me introduce you all to this. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the world today. Uh, there's a lot of unrest in the Middle East. There's natural disasters around the United States and war. These can lead to supply chain shortages for medication and an inability to get the meds you need in a timely manner. So don't be unprepared. Your health is wealth. But there's a solution. It is the Jace case. It is personalized emergency medication kit that contains five essential antibiotics that treat the most common and deadly infections. You can also customize your case and add additional life-saving meds based on what you and your families 
unique needs are. Everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. Jace handles everything from online evaluation to licensed pharmacy, medication delivery, and ongoing consultation and care. You can even buy a gift card for family or your loved ones so they can get a Jace case of their own. Go to jacemedical.com and enter the code Locked On at checkout for a $20 discount on your order. That's promo code Locked On on jacemedical.com. Yes, that health is wealth, folks. That is something that I abide by or try to each and every day. And so we are now back to our program where we are going to discuss, well, before we do, I just want to thank you all for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first first listen every day. Tomorrow, our WNBA draft and pro player development scouting crew will be back for their next episode of WNBA Retrospect. They'll be breaking down the college film of 2023 WNBA League MVP, Brianna Stewart. Now, let's move to Skytown. So, what did we learn from this press conference? Well, it was a little bit more upbeat. I think the the reception and vibes were a little bit better. Um, and I think that has to do with with the name they hired, Teresa Weatherspoon, of course, a legendary player, someone with also with NBA um, experience on an NBA bench. Um, and I think someone who's been loved at, at every stop of her, her playing career and, and coaching career. Um, you know, this is a franchise, I think, in a really interesting position. It always seemed like kind of a shame to me that um, they weren't really treating the franchise, the, that ownership wasn't really treating the franchise like the premier franchise that a, a team in Chicago really should be, right? Um, it's it's kind of a shame that across all sports, Chicago has such terrible owners um, that, that it... it comes across like a small market when it isn't. It's such a great basketball town. We saw that um, during the the 2021 uh, championship run. And so if it's true that, that, you know, ownership is, is really investing and, you know, Kalia Copper at least seemed convinced of that, right. She, she signs, she's up there at the press conference. Um, Then I think that's, that's good for, for the team, for the players, for the city. Absolutely. I mean, I think, I don't know if you felt this way, but I did when I heard that Kalia Copper signed an extension. I mean, they did it up to the last, the absolute last second where they're, they're sitting at a pregame and Annie Costable, the Chicago sometimes is like, so are you guys, were you going to try to extend Kalia Copper? And then there was a very weird answer. And then what happens? We get a press release during, I think it was either during pre warmups or the beginning of the game. Kalia Copper is re-signed by this interesting hybrid GMing committee that consists of Nadia Rawlinson, CEO, Adam Fox, and, you know, principal owner, Michael Alter. Oh boy. We have a GMing committee once again. <laughs> So, I think we have now a greater understanding of why Clea Copper didn't test free agency? Possibly? Thoughts? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it just sounds like there were promises made to her, right, about about how the the franchise was going to be run going forward, about uh, no GM head coach uh, you know, doubling up on that job anymore. Uh, I don't know that the the committee is necessarily a way better solution. I guess we'll see. I think it probably is better than having one person do both jobs because um, it it always seemed to me like James Wade was was really overextended in in his role. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
it seems like she is is confident in this. I don't think she makes that kind of decision if she's not, because she's someone who could who could definitely um, test free agency and I, I think find a, a good landing spot somewhere else. But you know, she's had success. She's been the the focal point of this team for the last year, and so it it seems like she is she's convinced at least. And and that was that was the that was management's job, right? This is the player they need to have around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, the the optics of getting Dwayne Wade to be an investor, that also probably was, um, I don't know, maybe eased some of her questions. And it seems to me, I mean, we can't assume, but... Clea Copper from that podium was talking about how she hasn't had someone in her career match her energy like the way that Teresa Weatherspoon does. And so we go back to those those vibes and what the podium looked like. Uh, When we contrast what we just spoke about in segment one about the Mercury How did that stand out to you? Yeah, I I thought it was interesting. Teresa Weatherspoon, I talked about all the different things a coach has to be. Tactician, the motivator part of it. And Teresa Weatherspoon is like, I can handle the the tactics part. The part that I think makes me, um, you know, that part is easy. The part that I think makes her, she said, her um, distinct and and what the hard part is for her is being that motivator is is creating relationships like she said that's that's going to be um what makes her successful as a head coach um and you know that's something I think goes back to her days as a player right when you're when you're the point guard there's a reason point guards end up head coaches a lot the same way you know catchers become managers right you are responsible for knowing personnel knowing who's having the good shooting night right you have to be just hyper aware of everything and and that's exactly what she was like as a player um as an NBA assistant I always you know just as I kept tabs on her career I always thought it was um really striking the way that the players in the Pelicans organization talked about her. I remember Zion Williams, Williamson, who who had kind of a tough injury riddled stretch saying, yeah, this is someone who like literally kept me from mental breakdowns. Um, and so that's, that's extremely valuable. I think uh, to, to have that energy, to have that leadership um, on, on your bench on and on your sideline. It's quite a contrast from what they previously had in, in James Wade. Um, you know, Teresa Weatherspoon has an intensity, but she is someone who preaches with the glass half full. And I think that's going to be very important for the Chicago sky. And so the next thing I want to get to before we take another break and we head to our third and final and really fun segment uh, around the horn style uh You know, I want to ask, what exactly did you gather from what the vision in Chicago is? Because there was a lot of talk about, we're going to provide for this team. The facility, it's coming, but we can't tell you when. We'll have an announcement before the end of the year. What did you glean from whatever vision the reporters were trying to get out of the folks at the podium? Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of sounds like they're they're trying to play catch up, and I think when you have the the off season that they did last year, that becomes kind of a a huge siren. Like, okay, we we need to do something. It's it's a bad look for us if Candace Parker is doing interviews saying she never had a locker until this year, um, and and so yeah, I think they're um, you know you don't always want to be the the team that's in catch up mode. You want to be setting the standard the way. Vegas has the way New York is starting to now. Um, but yeah, it, it sort of seems like the, that was a big wake up call. Like now they, they, or they at least want to say they are going to, to start making player experience a bigger priority, um, a, a better practice facility. 
I think you're going to see that from from teams across the league. This franchise, I think, just in terms of personnel, is in an interesting position. I think a lot of people looked at at the offseason um, just in terms of the roster last year. I was one of them and was like, all right, what, what exactly are we doing here? You're trading picks. You're still kind of in win now mode. And to some extent, I respect it. I think a team is like obligated to put a good and fun product on the court. And I actually think like this guy, they didn't have a great season record wise, but I thought they're generally like fun to watch. Any team headlined by Kalia Copper is probably going to be like the most awesome thing to watch. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's still, I don't know that there's a clear direction. It, it didn't, I didn't get the sense that they were going to like totally tank. It seems like they want to compete. They want to be good. They, um, you know, they, they want to invest in their players and, and they want to win. That's definitely easier said than done. Right. And it, yeah. it didn't seem like they were very close when, you know, they got a test. They played the aces in the playoffs. We thought, right? Yeah, I mean, I could go on and on and talk about how the Aces' ver- first round versus the Liberty's first round. I mean, sure, a seven seed and an eight seed, the seven seed should be better, but the seven seed was much better than the eight seed. Right. What, what, that that is a whole other. They probably thing. also were better than a seven seed usually is that team in particular, but but yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't see the the sky being like, oh, they're one player away here. They're, you know, they're one small tweak. I guess they're one player in terms of what they can realistically do away here, right? Um, and, you know, they were left in kind of an awkward position by by a coach who, uh, slash GM who made pretty serious roster moves and, and trade moves with, I think, long-term implications for this team. Um, ahead of really great drafts, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's it's not an easy path forward, I don't think. Um, but I, I do think they were right to to want to keep Kalia Copper around. Oh, absolutely. You need to have a foundation. But just bouncing off of what you were saying, Nadia Rawlinson, who I'm still not sure if the Board of Governors has approved her as a co-owner yet, we know that the Board of Governors has approved of Tom Brady as a member of the Aces ownership group, but that is an aside. She said the overall vision is to win. So no mention of player development, no mention of team building, no mention of, you know, how, how this team is going to come together. They do not have a general manager yet, which we will get to in the next segment. And then... Teaspoon interjected during this moment that I thought was absolutely fascinating. She said, where we are, we have enough. And this was when Annie Costable asked about those resources and the timeline on the practice facility. And she said something like, we're going to provide all the resources that our players are going to need to get to where we're going to be. And I was just like, I was very confused by that comment. I don't know what you made of that. Yeah, I think it's that mix of, you know, wanting to think in the long term, like, yeah, we're going to we're going to focus on a practice facility. We're going to make all these long term investments. But also you've got players who are on the team right now and and need to be motivated and treated right. And, you know, it's it's always a tricky balance to strike between. Um, wanting to think these big picture things about the franchise, but also kind of realizing that you have this team in the day and now. That's what I always thought was just a bad situation for James Wade when he had the coach GM role. One of the one of those jobs is to win your games. One of those jobs is to kind of think big picture and you know with a wide lens about your team and its future. And it's, it's hard to do both. Um, I think Teresa Weatherspoon's job right now is just to do one, to, to win games, to keep her team happy. Um, And so I can see why she maybe interjected and said that. 
Yes, but I just when you don't have a GM, it, it's just it's, it's very hard. And, and for her to just say things like "Where we are, we have enough." Clearly, they do not. I, I it just it, it blew my mind. But I appreciate you breaking that down in that way because it highlights the position she's in right now. The fact that she had to interject and say that. Okay, coming up, we are going to play our very fun game of buy or sell, which completely slipped my mind earlier when I stumbled over it. But again, we have some sponsors to chat about. And I do want to chat with y'all about prize picks. So... Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous section of players and stat types are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. You select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and place your entry. Testing my skills on Prize Picks this football season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy. But also, women's college basketball is coming. So how often will Caitlin Clark put up a triple-double? How many boards will Angel Reese have? How many points will Haley Van Lith score on her new team? Those are all questions that you can consider on prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA and use code LockedOnNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that is prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code locked on NBA prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy and thank you prize picks and we move into our final segment of the day, which this, I hope this is as fun as I'm building it up for. So we're going to do an around the horn style buy or sell round. Uh, I have a bunch of like conditionals, questions. I'm going to ask my three these, and she is going to say if she buys it, she believes it, or eh, she... She's not, she's not sold <laughs> or, you know, move on. And I'm going to start with, will Diana Taurasi actually buy into playing defense in 2024 by herself? Well, my first instinct is to say sell, of course, though I have to admit Diana Taurasi has this history of like saying things that I just assume are a joke and then Remember when she said, see you in Paris last Olympics? Like she might actually go, <laughs> wish she could actually go to the Paris Olympics. She's still around. I, I would I just assume it was a joke because of course she was going to retire by now, but nope, she, she still is. So I'm going to stick with sell, but um, the, the more I think about it, I don't, I don't know how much, uh, I don't know how to, how seriously to take her sometimes. Okay. Next one. We're going back to Chicago. Will the Chicago Sky hire a general manager who has knowledge of the CBA and player personnel? Buy or sell? I'm going to sell. I think they do another kind of out of the box, style, outside the box style hire and, and, um, and maybe hire from outside the league. Hmm. Mm hmm. Interesting. Now, going back to another general manager, but Phoenix's, Nick, you ran, mentioned player development and Nate Tibbetts' values when it comes to doing that. Buy or sell, will the Mercury have a younger roster than they've had in years in 2024? I'm going to buy that because I think they're going to draft someone young. And uh, I think that it's kind of a cheating answer, right? But I think that person will just bring down their, their average age. Absolutely. Could be a generational talent. Could be. Could be. Not a, not a bad year to be bad. Okay. We also talked about Nadia Rollinson talking about the vision, that it's twin. The Sky are still in this, like, in-between mode. 
especially where, you know, a lot of their draft capital is with the Dallas Wings, question mark. So the free agency market is much more dry this coming winter than it was last winter. So buy or sell, the Chicago Sky will have more than 18 wins following the 2024 regular season. This is a tough one for me. Sorry to break the rapid fire response ones just because I don't really know what the roster looks like next year. Some some contracts still open ended. So let me just be optimistic. I'll I'll buy. I'll buy. How many Teresa Weatherspoon has me fired up and inspired. I'll buy. Nineteen wins, twenty maybe. Okay. All right. Will Nate Tibbetts be the highest paid WNBA coach in a year's time by yourself? Um, I'm going to sell. I think uh, I think uh, Becky Hammond will, will probably get a raise. I think probably Sandy Brondello. Should. And yeah, I think she's due for one also. But anyway, final one here before we sign off. The Skies practice facility and whether they're going to buy it or rent it will be ready for use in 2026, buy or sell. Oh, if I feel so far away, I'm just going to say buy, but I don't know. I don't know how long construction takes on these things. Everyone else has done theirs pretty quickly, so I'll, I'll just say buy. Okay, I lied. One last one. Will Brittany Griner be on the Phoenix Mercury's 2024 roster? I'll buy that. Although she wasn't mentioned in that press conference. She was not mentioned in the press conference, but... Um, which I found very weird. Yes. But that is a whole topic for another podcast. We want to thank you for making Locked on Women's Basketball your first listen every day. And I want to give a huge, huge shout out to my three for hopping on the show today. Follow her on the interwebs at... M-A-I-T-R-E-Y-I-A-A. Yes, I spelled it all out in case you are not watching us on YouTube. And read her work at Defector. It is a wonderful, wonderful sports and culture and news website. And check us out tomorrow. Our WNBA draft and pro player development scouting crew are back for their WNBA retrospect episode all about Brianna Stewart, which I'm sure that will be incredibly exciting. Well, anyway, this has been great, and we hope you all have a wonderful Friday and a restful weekend. This has been Jackie Powell and my three and Anthony Roman. And we are signing off. Ogumba Wallet. For the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. 